Hey everybody, I'm Ryan Doyle, this is The Vertigree Table, and in this Dungeon Master prep video we are talking about Umbridge Hill from the Dragon of Ice Spire Peak, the adventure inside the Dungeons & Dragons Essentials Kit. This is the first quest that we're covering in the series, so if you're thinking about running this adventure, you're definitely going to want to hit subscribe and make sure you don't miss out on the rest of this playlist. Now, unless the Dungeon Master decides otherwise, which is your right as the DM, when they get started in the town of Phandalin, the players are going to be given three quests. As written, they're actually like on a job board placed there by the town master, Harbin Wester of uh, Ill Repute, uh, and you can change that premise for sure. No problem, but props are always nice and handing out these three cards provided in the box can be a lot of fun. Now keep in mind when the players are strategizing and debating about what to do, that is still playing D&D. Maybe you can encourage them to do it in character or at least like focus in on what their characters who don't know that they're in a game would do, but let them work it out among themselves. I know you might get a little antsy, you know, to want to jump to the action or feel like you need to pick up the pace to keep things interesting for your players, but let them talk while you enjoy the rest it gives your vocal cords and actively listen because there might be some very useful information in what they say. Sometimes the players are going to have a false idea of the situation, which you can maybe exploit <laughs> or correct them if their characters would clearly know better. But also, sometimes the players are going to come up with something way cooler than what is in the book or your notes. So don't be afraid to run with it if that happens and just pretend it was the plan all along. Now, if I had to bet my money's on the players heading for Umbridge Hill first, simply because looking at the map, it's the closest spot and it is on the way to the other two locations. I actually think it's a good first stop for a couple of reasons. So we can kind of tip the scales that way a little bit. It by having the town master or a shopkeeper, an NPC at the Stonehill Inn, whoever, talk about how Adabra Gwyn is the only source of healing potions around here. Now, the players can go in any direction at this point, so definitely be ready to run all three starting quests or have this decision get made at the end of a session so that you have time to prepare. Even so, players can change their minds at a moment's notice, so I like being ready for anything. Having some random encounters handy are also always good for, you know, buying time, filling in the gaps, but it is absolutely okay to also be like, guys, you said you were doing this and I prepped this, can we please do this? Or I need to take a break to prep this other thing you're saying you want to do now and it probably won't be as good. If you really don't have the bandwidth to prep for more than one of these and the players can't make a choice before sitting down to play, then just give these quests out one at a time but I think you can manage to prepare for all three here, especially because Umbridge Hill is super short, so simple, which is another reason I like it as the first quest. So the main thing to consider at Umbridge Hill is the Manticore. Now the challenge rating or CR system is an imperfect beast at best, but setting that all aside for a moment, uh, Manticore is CR3, meaning it should put up a fair fight for four level three characters. That means it is likely to destroy a first level party with ease. Now, personally, I don't need or even really want every encounter in my world to be perfectly balanced, but I also don't want to kill all the players first thing and maybe end this campaign or perhaps even the hope of getting some new people, my friends, into D&D. So we can do a couple things here to make sure we don't have a total party kill. So the first option is not have the party be level one to start. Level one characters have very few hit points and abilities and die very easily. So you can just start at level two. Some groups even always start at level three just as a default. Now, personally, I like the sense of progression starting at one delivers. I also enjoy just the, the different feel and the challenges it provides on both sides of the Dungeon Master screen. Plus, if you've got new players or a new DM, it is way easier to start at level one and then add on options and abilities as things go on. So option two is start at level one, but buff their hit points. The simplest way I see to do that is to have Sister G actually at the shrine in town where she can cast aid on the party and give everybody an extra 5 HP as they set out. You could also double down and have her hand out a blessing or like trinkets of Timora's luck and give each player a charge of inspiration as well. We can also look to the other side of this equation as well and nerf the manticore. 
In his great series on this adventure, Bob Worldbuilder talks about having it potentially be emaciated or a young manticore, so it has less HP and only one attack. We could also get there by having it be injured by cryovane. Maybe it looks <laughs> mangy, right? And on closer inspection, it turns out it's actually got frostbite from the dragon's breath weapon, which stops it from using its second claw attack. Or maybe it's used up all of its tail spikes in that fight. Remember, at every opportunity, it's going to be good to tie things back to the dragon so that our campaign feels a little more like a cohesive whole. And right here at the beginning, we can do that by having the Manticore talk about it. Because what's really going on in this kind of crazy mismatch of a battle is that the adventure is trying to encourage the players, and the DM for that matter, to realize that not every encounter has to be combat, and not every combat has to be to the death. That is definitely a lesson worth taking from this quest and remembering throughout your D&D career. Now, the book does mention this idea early on in the introduction and references this specific quest. Although fighting the monster is always an option, characters might decide to negotiate with the Manticore instead. Now, maybe it should say fighting the monster at level one is an option that will likely lead to a TPK. And probably on this page where a first time DM will be looking when they're running this, don't get me wrong. I am all for giving the players their freedom of choice. And I want to make sure that those choices are meaningful. If the Manticore is going to get away, right, or eat Abdara, no matter what the players do, that's railroading, yes? But if the player characters are going to win any fight and the Manticore is going to die, no matter what, that's also a predetermined outcome and doesn't feel right to me. Now, realistically, when we describe this monster assaulting a tower while a woman calls for help from an upper window to our new players who have a shiny new character sheet in front of them listing all the cool ways that they can hurt stuff, they're likely going to want to fight this thing. And we want to let them, but we definitely don't want to kill everybody, right? If we make the Manticore sound especially nasty in our descriptions or straight up tell them that like, you might be outmatched here, maybe that discourages them from attacking a little bit. But if combat does break out, we can have this fairly intelligent and definitely wise magical creature the story has already established will retreat from a fight fly away after it takes some amount of damage. You control this thing so you can have it do what you want. I would have it want to negotiate instead of fighting a bunch of armed humanoids, especially after the day or week it's been having. It can fly 50 feet away, maybe out of range of some of the PCs, also showing new players, hey, you probably want a ranged attack option. Then it will try to talk to our heroes while holding a barrage of tail spikes if they try to hurt it again. Spread those around because that's seven damage a piece on average. Hitting a level one character three times might end them outright. If there are sidekicks in the mix here, maybe go for them first. And if a PC drops, the monster can say, do you want to talk now or maybe I should keep killing people? Maybe be a little bit nicer about it, but whatever. It has written, the Manticore wants food or treasure. And I'm sure it would also be perfectly happy to send our heroes up into those mountains to chase off the dragon. Maybe after they've leveled up a little bit, wink, wink. This might be a little bit controversial, but having a, a NPC or a monster that can break the fourth wall a little bit, even get a little metagamey with it, can be a real asset for a DM. And this weird, evil, sphinx-like thing feels like a great candidate for that. Having it show up with its Cheshire cat grin bristling with deadly spikes deep in the darkness of the Neverwinter Wood or somewhere many sessions from now might be a great callback. Whether the Manticore is delivering an important nugget of information for more gold and rations, obviously, or it's just all healed up, reunited with its mate, and ready to attack our adventurers. But back to this encounter, remember that a Dara Gwyn is also there too. If you need somebody to say, hey, that Manticore is probably too tough for you to kill, or even toss a healing potion down while somebody is making death saves. 
uh, as written, though she'll be very thankful for the assist here, she will not be willing to return to Phandalin. So the players might feel like they won't be able to fulfill their very first mission. If this really bothers them, then yeah, I might let them succeed in convincing her to come along or at least attempt a persuasion or intimidation check. But it's probably going to be enough if Adarbra says, hey, I'll give you a potion of healing and a note to take to that old fool so he'll give you the reward. This is also like an opportunity to have her say something like that coward wants us all to bunch up together so that the dragon can get us all in the same breath weapon attack. I'm better off here. Uh, explaining that she needs to stay at the mill with her supplies in order to make more healing potions to sell to the party at a future date. It's also going to be a great incentive for them to respect her wishes and let her remain in her home. Where maybe this mill doubles as a shrine to her harvest goddess. That makes sense, right? So she doesn't want to abandon it. Whether she stays here or moves to town, Abdara is an NPC the players will likely want to revisit to get healing potions from later on. So take a little bit of extra time to develop her in prep, as we discussed in that last video. In my game, I actually merged or replaced her with Penelope from my Tower of Rydal adventure, who you can see in the full preview on the DM's Guild, including a roll table for what else she might have for sale at any given moment. If you want to give your players a more worthwhile way to spend all that gold they'll accumulate throughout this campaign. And even if you don't go that far, I would consider having her reward the party with an oil of sharpness as well right here. Maybe it's a version that only does, you know, plus one instead of plus three, but you can go a little overboard with magical items that are single use. The important thing is that it makes a mundane weapon's damage magical, meaning you can actually touch those wear rats in the mountains to later on. We should also think about having some silvered weapons laying around in these starter quests or up for sale back in town. If the party gets to that mine and most of the characters can't do any damage, it might be serious trouble and almost definitely not so much fun. So let's start setting up for that one early. We do have the ruins of this old stone house and the carns of these dwarven graves here. They're not doing much as written. So they're good places to maybe hide something, even if it's just like a silvered dagger or a club that can cast shillelagh on itself. Now we're told that these dwarves fell in a battle that gave the hill its name, but as written, no one remembers why these two clans were feuding. Later on, we're going to get Axholm, an abandoned dwarven fortress where there's evidence that they've worshipped Moradin, the main good dwarven god, and our potential next stop may very well be the excavation site where a temple to the evil dwarven god of greed has been uncovered. So there's a likely backstory if you want or need one. You could also connect this location to Fandelver's Pact or a player character's backstory. If you've got a dwarf in the party, maybe one of their ancestors is buried here, and now a few of these upcoming quests can be way more personal. Maybe they have to learn about or redeem or even revenge their legacy at the Dwarven Excavation, the next stop in our Dungeon Master's Prep playlist. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. I will see you there. Until then, have fun. Be kind to yourself. Be kind to each other. And thanks so much for watching. Bye.